So <clears throat> our program for today is quite challenging, so I am going slowly. We will start to introduce first deformations and secondly moduli spaces, but we won't do it in the most general setting. I will always run it in parallel in a very concrete setting for those who are not familiar maybe with category theory or who are not familiar with schemes, algebraic varieties, or they have a concrete grasp on what's going on. And then we will also give the categorical definition of moduli spaces. So the, the difference between deformations and moduli spaces is the following. Deformations are always kind of local. You take an object and you deform it a little bit with a parameter essentially moving in a small interval. Whereas moduli spaces have global parameter spaces, so you move often very far away from your object. So that's a completely different setting. Deformations in some sense are easier to handle. Moduli spaces are more difficult to prove that they exist, or sometimes they don't exist as we want. Okay. So after this <coughs> kind of abstract lecture today, I will make a break going back to cross ratios and projective geometry. So the class next week, which will be recorded in advance because I am not in Vienna next week on Tuesday, but I will send you all the details and the links. So next week we'll do just computing with in projective space with lines, cross ratios, and the group action of PGL2. So <clears throat> I do this because we need some time to digest the concept of moduli space. So even though the definition is not so complicated, to understand really what it captures is not so easy. So we will do a first setting today. I am not sure if I will be able to do everything I prepared. Then we will have a kind of exercise session with cross ratios, working and computing with them. And then we return to the abstract definition of moduli spaces. And then I hope that you have at least a feeling what's going on. So <clears throat> maybe I can start with a motivation why we call these things moduli. So the today's subject, maybe I move this a little bit downwards. So we will talk first about deformations and second about moduli spaces. So I, I realized that actually deformations were the topic of my thesis, which is quite a while ago. So I want to start with an example which I think is due to, to Hasler Whitney, which is a very simple example, but which is nice because it tells us something interesting. So we take a continuous family of four lines, and we just do it in R2. And by this, I mean just a defining polynomial. We take ft of x and y. We take x times x minus y times x plus y. So up to here, the parameter t does not appear. But now it will appear, x plus t times y. So in order to have, indeed, so let me call v of t in rt, vt, ft inverse of 0. So we will assume, in order to have actually four lines through 0 in r2, or you can do it over any field, it doesn't matter. So you need to assume that t is different from 0 and plus minus 1. Otherwise, two lines will collapse. Okay. So it's quite difficult to draw this. I will 
give an, make an effort to t, t is in r. Yeah? In the example, this suffices. So we take here r, and we let t vary vertically. So what do we have? If we forget about this last factor here, we just have three lines which don't move with t. So And as t moves, these stay, stay constant. So here we have the intersection. I'm not going to draw everything. But I hope that you can see what's going on. OK? So this continues here. So three lines are not changing. But what does the fourth line? The fourth line is rotating. So let me draw it like this in blue. This is number 4, which depends now on t. And uh, maybe this continues. I think you have to close your eyes and you have to imagine what's going on. So this line is just rotating like a staircase. No? It's going down. And uh, of course, the parameter will be t for each. If you take a horizontal section here, you get four lines, as, except if t is 0, 1, or minus 1. But now the, the point here is the following. If we look here and here, the cross ratio of the four lines, maybe I try to draw them like this. Yeah. Whenever you intersect horizontally, the cross ratio, which we did not define in detail yet, but let us just assume we know what it is, varies with t. So this implies, as the cross ratio determines the geometry, the local analytic or even differential geometry, this implies that <coughs> Vt is not isomorphic to Vs for t different s, excluding some special value, except for special values. OK? So here you could take, for instance, you could even take C1 or C infinity, or you could do it also holomorphically if you're working over the complex numbers. OK? So these are not isomorphic, not even locally at the, here in the middle. So this is not completely obvious, but it's not very hard to show. So this means that if we start now with one given t, start with t equals t0, so we fix one value t0 here. Uh, of course, again, different 0 plus minus 1. And if we take now t close to t0, we get an infinity of different isomorphism types, infinity of equivalence classes, or what local isomorphism types. Can you read here in the last line? I can't see the last line. You can't no. see. But the second to last line is OK? Yes. OK. Equivalence class, I can write it above, isomorphism types. OK. So this is something I talked about last time, that when you deform, if the singularity is very elementary, then you might hope to just get nearby finitely many types. But here is essentially the first example where you get an infinity of different types 
which are arbitrarily close to your section t equals t0. So this would be, so the singularity here would be non-simple. Singularity is not simple. And one says that the singularities or the intersection of these, the union of these four lines has moduli. The four lines have moduli. So what does this mean? I.e., there is a parameter, namely t, regulating the type, isomorphism type. And this parameter is not discrete, not discrete, but continuous. OK? So that's the first appearance in this example of moduli. You have something which varies and which produces a whole realm of different types. Okay. So I, last time I drew this picture, if you, draw, if you think of orbits of a group action, and if you take one point in an orbit, then and if you deform it, so deforming it would mean that you move along here, then you hit infinitely many other orbits. Okay. So <clears throat> we can projectivize this picture. I was told that I should clean with more care. I will do my best. Now this is a little bit delicate. I already suggested to our university to buy a second light board so we have less cleaning business. <clears throat> But you are patient, and you are a fantastic audience, so that's OK. Yes, just a second. I just finished cleaning. Yes, please. Yes, <laughs> that's right. It looks always the same, but only topologically. You cannot find a C1 isomorphism between the four lines. That's very surprising, but it is like this. If you have three lines, you can find an isomorphism. But if you have four lines, you cannot do it, because the cross ratio determines everything. OK? Uh, OK, so you, you look at the singularity as a whole. In PGLs. So no, at the action of the lines. Yes, but even so if you have a if you have a diffeomorphism sending this section to this section, then the tangent map, the tangent map will send the tangent lines to the tangent lines, but they coincide because you have lines. So you get a linear map induced on the tangent on the tangent cone from here to here, and that's not possible because of the cross ratio. Yeah, you, have, you pass to the tangent map to see this. OK? So let me draw the projective picture. In P1, that's even easier to draw. So what happens? So now. This will be P1. And now again, we have T vertically. We have many T P1s, always the same, of course. And the four lines will correspond just to four points. No? And three of them remain in the same location in our P1. Nothing is happening here. These are the three lines. And the fourth one, 
maybe it starts here, it will move. Not very nice move, but you see what I want. And here you would have just constancy. And now you see perfectly well that if you go, if you look horizontally at one of these horizontal P1s, then the cross ratio here between these four points and these four points is different. Okay? I will define and discuss the cross ratio in all detail next time. But for today, let's just accept it. Okay. So, <clears throat> in view of this, I want to. I think last time, towards the end, I was going quite fast about simple singularities. So let me go back again to the concept of simple singularities, and give you again the classification and some more extra information. OK. So simple singularities. And they will lead us to the concept of deformation of functions. So I restricted to analytic maps. Now we are going over this complex numbers, analytic map, locally defined in the neighborhood of 0. So 0 goes to 0, just to avoid complications. And we look at deformations. So f of x, y, z. And then we will introduce a parameter t, x, y, z, which means that the coefficients start to vary with t. Now f has a power series, but think of a polynomial. Think of a polynomial, and you allow the coefficients to move. Okay. So how? And simple means corresponds to only finitely many types appear for t close to t0. If you go far away, then of course you could have worse singularities and many others, but if you if you keep close, then it should be OK. And I will give you a very simple example. Werte Studierenden, aufgrund von technischen Problemen muss die Bibliothek heute um 18 Uhr schließen. Dear students, due to technical problems, the library closes at 6 o'clock today. Sorry for this interruption, but we are in the library and they are closing. So I hope that I can leave the library afterwards. Otherwise, I, we keep talking the whole night. Okay? So let us take f equals x cubed plus y squared plus z squared, and ft f plus g t x y 0 z, where g of 0 x y z is identically zero. So this is the, what we could call the deformation term, the perturbation. And then, of course, and that's something I don't want to do here, we have to look at this ft up to isomorphism, up to local isomorphism. And the computations are tedious. So I want to skip them and ask you to believe me. But what could happen, so I will give you Two examples what we can get. So if we add here ft equals, for instance, f plus t x5, then this is, in a certain sense, a small term which can be eliminated by a coordinate change, by an analytic coordinate change. It's not too difficult, so this does not count. It does not give you anything new. 
you only get something new up to isomorphism if you decrease the orders. So you could get, uh, maybe I write f tilde. One thing you could get is you get here x square plus y square plus z square. Okay. So what would be ft? You add plus tx square. Now, when you take t equals 0, you get f. But if you take t different 0, then by the coordinate change, you may kill this x cubed. And you are left with x square plus y square plus z square. That's a little bit the idea behind. And if you add here, instead of tx square, you add tx, then you would even get x plus y square plus z square. And the last one will define a, a zero z, which is a manifold, because you have the x here. So starting with this f, x cubed, and so on, you prove by computation that only these two types are possible. Only possibility. So this implies that this one is simple. But you agree that I cannot do the computation here. Okay, but that's a little bit the feeling. Whenever you add terms in T which have big degree, then you can kill them by coordinate changes. But if they have small degree, then they survive and kill the earlier terms. Okay. So let me formalize this a little bit <coughs> in terms of group actions. So I always have to switch between cheating and waving hands and being precise. And <clears throat> I ask you for a little bit of understanding that we cannot be 100% precise all the time. So what is the background? We have a group action. Just to act, formalize a little bit. So our function f will be an element. We just take a convergent power series. Okay. Convergent series. So we don't have to care where it is defined. It is defined in a neighborhood of 0. And the group, which maybe I denote by capital G, are the, the biholomorphic isomorphisms of C3. That's what we call analytic coordinate changes. And this group G acts on. Now I write c x y z, c x y z. If you have a phi and f, then you just compose. Okay, that's the group action which defines your notion of isomorphism. You could choose different ones, but we take this one here. Okay. So phi, the g, an element phi will have three components: phi one, phi two, phi three. And this will be, as I assume that 0 is preserved, these phi's have no constant term. So this will be in x, y, z times uh, c, x, y, z to the third. A vector of three power series without constant terms. So again, uh, we want to study f with respect to this group action. And what we do, we look at the orbit. That's again the library, don't mind. The orbit will be g yeah. times f. Ah, I just, you heard also that we can stay. OK. So. <clears throat> Let me draw again a very naive picture, the orbits like this. I'm very sorry, but that's the only picture I can draw here. These are the orbits. 
and our vector our function f will be a point here. So this is all this is inside C x, y, z. Now you have to you have to think group theoretically and in terms of differential geometry, both. No? So this picture holds in an infinite dimensional space. And this here is the orbit, g times f. Okay. Now we want to, to study f and ft close to f. And as I said before, we will take something like this and try to understand ft. So what you do, and that's classical in differential geometry, you compute the tangent space tfgf. Now that's difficult to draw. Maybe I can I draw a bigger picture. This is one orbit. Here we have f. You compute the tangent space. Okay. And in order to describe all possible deformations of f, you take a normal space. So maybe I, it works with red. You choose here a normal space. So this is n f. A direct complement, the blue one would be t f g f. And here we have g times f. Okay, And then that's a, a very basic idea. You expect that this normal space, at least locally, will hit all orbits which are close to f. So if you draw here the nearby orbits, of course, the picture is a little bit cheating. You have a good chance to hit all of them, at least locally at f. Okay, Even though we are in an infinite, infinite dimensional space. And uh, that's actually here true. <clears throat> For simple singularities, this holds true that you get all of them. And the reason is that the singularity is not too bad. So let me compute this tangent space, because it's a funny computation. How do you compute? Uh, a tangent vector to a manifold, you just take a curve and you derive it. So what we do here, we take phi t. So this will be, let me do it from c0 to g, a curve, analytic as always. g is a, a Lie group, a complex Lie group. And then we take f composed with phi t. So this will be now a parametrized curve in orbit, g times f. Okay. I cannot draw it because my orbits are just uh, curves. No? And we derive with respect to t, dt f composed with phi t. And we get phi t dt times dx f composed with phi t. Now, for technical reasons, you compose with phi t inverse, and you get dt f composed with phi t. Phi t is an isomorphism, so I can compose with the inverse. You get dt phi t composed with phi t inverse times dxf. Now, x stands for x1, x, y, and z. Let me just write x. Maybe I should underline it. Okay. So these are the tangent vectors when evaluated at t equals 0. And here we assume that phi 0 is the identity, the identity map. So what we get as a tangent space, tf, gf, 
is now I write it again. It is the ideal x, y, z times dxf, dyf, and dzf. And this takes place inside cx, y, z. So you get a linear combination of partial derivatives, and the coefficients are supposed to have no constant term. And now there's a effect which is not very difficult to prove, but I'm not going to do. If v of f <coughs> has a, so in our pictures, the v of f, which is a zero set of f, it will be smooth, and this is the case for simple singularities, it will be smooth everywhere except at zero. So zero is what is called an isolated singularity. Isolated singularity. And I, ah, so this means v of minus zero is smooth. I think, I hope that you can still read here. Then this tangent space has finite co-dimension, tf, gf, finite co-dimension. And now we have already constructed what is called the universal deformation. That's the local analog of moduli spaces. Maybe you have heard about universal deformations. That's a deformation which contains all possible deformations. And you do the following. <coughs> so this was very popular in the 70s and 60s. And it was maybe so popular because they coined a fantastic name for it. They called this theory catastrophe theory. Uh, of course, many people were attracted by this name. But what is behind is just what I'm doing here. So they're not really singularities were called catastrophes. So it's like a little bit chaos theory, which popped up in the beginning of the 21st century. And uh, it was a good name. So what happens here is now you take, you take c, x, y, z, mod this tangent space, d, x, f, d, y, f, d, z, f. So this is now a finite dimensional C vector space. So you choose m1 up to mk. You can choose monomials if you want, x, y, z, whose residue classes inside here are a basis. And then you get <clears throat> the universal deformation. of f, which is now a multi-parameter family of deformations. And it is as follows. You write f of x plus you take this basis. Again, I write x for x, y, and z. You take ti mi of x i from 1 to k. And maybe we call this capital F tx. And the meaning is, to, do, to be precise, I should call it semi-universal, but let's forget about this. The meaning here is that this family with ti in our field, let's say in the complex numbers, nearby 0, that this family contains all deformations of f up to isomorphism contains all deformations 
f t of x of f up to isomorphism. Okay, if you just have one parameter t, you take, for instance, f t of x. Let me write it like this. It will be equivalent to capital F. So here I should t underline. So t underline is a vector, but t is just one parameter. And what you do, you, you, parameter, you take here gamma 1 of t. You substitute your variables t1 up to tk by functions in the one parameter t and x. Okay, this t means isomorphic. Okay, so let me let me <coughs> review this. We start with one object f of x. We deform it with a local parameter. The t i and the t are just local. So this captures a little bit that we only look at objects which are very close to f. No? If we deform with a continuous parameter, we don't move too much far away. And then this object here, which captures all possible deformations, is called the local moduli space of a function f. Okay. So let me check what the time is. Oh, I'm running much too late. Yeah, so that's about the universal deformation. I want to add something concerning the simple singularities because there is something very nice happening. And maybe I complete further details in the notes because uh, there is much more to say. So let me recall the list of simple singularities. We had a k given by x to the k plus y squared plus z squared. d k, I never remember x k minus 1 plus x y square plus z square e 6 x cubed plus y 4 plus z square e 7 was defined by x cubed plus x y cubed plus z square. The z square is kind of a dummy parameter. And e 8 was x 3 plus y 5. So this is a very famous singularity which was studied a lot by Felix Klein. So <clears throat> the A case, of course, whenever you have such an A k singularity, when you deform it, you will get something which is still simpler. So the, the lowest one is A1. A1 is, corresponds to x plus y squared plus z squared. And because of this x here, this is smooth. So that's the simplest one in our hierarchy. Let me write it here, a1. If you take a2, then you get x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And you can deform it into a1. And I will draw an arrow, a vertical arrow, to indicate this. So a2 deforms in a1, but a1 does not deform in a2. The next complicated is a3, a4, a5. I think I need up to a6. So that the arrows always mean a small deformation looking up to isomorphism. Now, interesting things happen. If you take d4, which is on this level here, recall that k here is at least 4. d4 cannot deform into a4, but it can deform into 
a3. d5 can deform in a4. So that's in terms of orbits, this is an adjacency of orbits. But d5 is also able to deform into d4, and similarly for d6. That's the famous adjacency diagram. So let me repeat. This one down here is the simplest one, second simplest one, third simplest one. Here we have two. They are about the same level of complexity, and they deform to A3. So what about E6, E7, and E8? So E6 is here, and E6 can deform to D5. It cannot deform to D6, but it can also deform directly to A5. So we get an additional arrow here. Then above, may you allow me to draw it here. We have E7 and E8. So all this is talking about how these are related to each other. And E7 can deform to D6, but also to A6. And similarly above here. Okay. You can extend this diagram a little bit, but that's the essential part. Okay. So that's the lowest part. These are the simplest singularities in the whole world of all possible singularities. I think I take five minutes more. I give you, I think, other characterizations, but I will write them here. So let f be as above, simple and denote x the zero set of f. So that's a germ locally at zero. So then we have, now some concepts will appear which you might not know, but I <coughs> add them for completeness. f is simple if and only if x can be resolved by point blow-ups. So I'm not going to explain this. A, a resolution is, so x will be a singular set, and x tilde will be a smooth surface. So this here is smooth. That's a very important concept in algebraic geometry. And the claim is that you only need to blow up in points. Blow up is a modification of varieties, which I'm not going to discuss today. The next one is, the next equivalence, that x is C2 modulo a finite group, g in SU2 C, a finite group. So that's very surprising. Now we have here a definition which relates to diffeomorphisms, holomorphic maps, automorphisms, and so on. And here we are suddenly in a very concrete and almost finite setting. We take finite subgroup of SU2C, we take the quotient, and we get precisely this list. Okay. So these finite groups, they are well known. These are the platonic symmetry groups. Okay. So the platonic solids are behind. Okay. And of course, you have to add here also the cyclic groups and the dihedral groups, which are of any order. Okay? So the cyclic group, which appears here, corresponds to A. The dihedral groups correspond to D. And then we have, uh, we have the cube, we have the icosahedron, and we have the octahedron. Am I right? Yes. No, the, we have the tetrahedron, the cube, and the icosahedron. And these three platonic solids correspond precisely to E6, E7, and E8. Okay. So the equation of uh, yes. Just to clarify, we are talking only about singularities. 
uh, it would be left to surfaces, right? At the moment, only surfaces, yes. There's a more general concept, but I'm not going to discuss it here. Okay. I just want to show you that very different things pop up. So this can be also characterized topologically. You take the fundamental group of, of this x. So x is locally nearby 0. In the neighborhood of 0, it is defined. But you take off the singularity. And another characterization is that this fundamental group is finite. Of course, this is complex, so it is very difficult to imagine. But it tells you that there must be something deeper behind, because so different objects. We have already now four different characterizations, and they all are completely different, but they all give you the same list. And uh, this continues. For instance, uh, you can characterize characterization of Dinkin diagrams, which I alluded to last time, Dinkin diagrams. And so on. Yeah. So I repeat there's this article of Durfee. I still owe you the, uh, the bibliography, but I hope to send you soon a, a list. Okay. So <clears throat> what is the upshot of all this? We have a concept of local modular space, just deforming a little bit our objects. We take here holomorphic functions, but we could take also algebraic varieties. We could take other objects. And we have a concept of the simplest object we can look at. No? And then we have a complete classification. OK, so yeah, that's a good point to have a short break, a uh, five minutes break, and then I will continue with the definition of global modular spaces. So give me a second. Maybe I can. Where's my? Okay, I think we, 
we can continue. So <clears throat> let me call this second part two, two words, a definition of moduli space. So we are not going to capture it completely today because of <clears throat> lack of time, but at least we will start with it. Okay. So maybe one should mention first <clears throat> uh, the remark, which is uh, maybe the starting point. We don't only want to classify objects up to a given equivalence relation, but rather families of objects. And this, this remark could have been done by Grotendieck. Whose, one of his philosophies was, if you look at an object, look at all its families. Okay? So we have to define what is a family. But maybe the, the initial remark is the following. So this is another remark. And we just do it for polynomials at the moment. If k is a field, a polynomial p in k x1 up to xn is an expression p of x equals c alpha x to the alpha, alpha in n to the n, where x alpha means x1 alpha 1 up to xn alpha n, and c alpha is in the field. That's a single object. That's not a family. Okay. Now, when Grotendieck introduced the concept of schemes, he replaced fields by rings. Okay. So, uh, Grotendieck, take coefficients not in the field k, but in a ring r. So that's kind of philosophical. But you should think of R typically R would be let me just take an example, the simplest example, the polynomial ring in one or several variables, T. T a variable. So now this P of X will depend on T, and we can write it C alpha t x alpha, alpha in n to the n. And now <coughs> the c alpha t themselves are polynomials in t. So this is now already a family in the sense of Grotendieck. And whenever we take t equals t0, an element in k, so if we specialize, we get, of course, p t0 of x which will be now a polynomial in k. Okay. That's all. Yeah. So I repeat, taking here coefficients which are polynomials, they are in particular according to the field, but assume that k is always the complex numbers. These here are special they are polynomials in t, but as such they are continuous. Okay. 
that I repeat what Grotendieck proposed, not to look at a single object, but at the family. Now, of course, if t moves very far, the polynomial pt will change enormously. Yeah? But at the moment, we don't care. So I am going to define uh, formally what the family is. And uh, let's now, how shall I say? I will do it on two levels, or actually on four levels. I will give you the categorical definition, and I will give you the definition for topological vectors, uh, for topological spaces. OK? So I assume that everybody is familiar with uh, categories. So let, I'm going slowly. Let D be a category. And C in D, I write it like this, a decent subcategory. I don't want to specify all the details here. What kind of categories you allow is called locally small categories. And what kind of subcategories you allow, it should be a full subcategory. So instead of giving you the details, I always give you the running examples. You take D topological spaces, spaces and C. Maybe you take the compact topological spaces. Or you take D algebraic varieties And for C, you take elliptic curves. OK? But just think of topological spaces for the moment. So within topological spaces, the morphisms are given by continuous maps. So a family in C is a morphism, let me just write it x to t in d. So there is now a distinction between c and d. A morphism so <clears throat> inside our topological spaces, x and t will be topological spaces, and this will be continuous. No? And what is the requirement? So x and t are in the bigger category with fibers x sub t in c, in the smaller category. So in the example 2, we could take for t, so algebraic for d, algebraic varieties and C elliptic curves, we would take xt to be an elliptic curve, but the base space, the t here is called the base space, can be more general. Then the fibers. Yeah. Or in, if you look at topological spaces, maybe you require that the fibers are compact, but the base space and x themselves are not compact. Okay, That's a decent possibility. Now, there's <coughs> there are technical problems. So in the, unfortunately, I did not find a, a good reference for all this yet. Uh, many of them are a little bit hand-waving, and I didn't want to go to the book of Mumford, and I don't want to overload this class here with technicalities. So I will try to...
I will try to be as precise as possible, giving you at the same time a feeling what's going on. So today we just have a little bit of time left, so I will start with this material or continue, but I cannot finish today. So what I propose that the next class, which will be on next Tuesday, Tuesday is a, next Tuesday is a holiday in, Aus holiday in Austria, but nevertheless, I will record a class and send you this class on next Tuesday so you don't feel any difference. But in this next class, I'm not going to continue with this material. I'm going to talk about cross ratios. And then we come back to the definition of modular spaces the week afterwards. Okay? I'll keep you informed. So what is the problem here that in an arbitrary category, it's not clear what the fiber is. Okay? So if f from x to t is continuous between topological spaces, and if t is in t, then xt, which is f inverse of t, will be, so I assume that the points are closed, so this will be, again, a topological space, is defined. And a topological space, but in arbitrary categories, we don't have a map necessarily. We don't have a map between sets. So uh, in general, For categories, fibers are defined via terminal objects. So uh, that's not a class on, on category theory. So what is a terminal object? You know that in a category, you have objects and morphisms between the objects. Now, an object is called terminal, and you should think of just having a point if you think of topological spaces. So uh, let me call it maybe T0. So I, I draw it as a, as a point. What is the pop property of the topological space which consists of one point, if you think of topological spaces, uh, the morphisms, the morphisms from any element, so A is an object in our category C or D, this is again just one point. Maybe this is a little bit misleading to write here. Uh, Maybe I erase this, but I want that there's just one possible map to this terminal object. Okay? And then you need fiber products. So <clears throat> maybe I should say a little bit about fiber products. Uh, if you have a, B, and T objects in your category, C, let me call the category C, you want to define something which is A times B over T. And if you think of topological spaces, it means the following. So we sit constantly between, between topological spaces and categories, and you have to make the translation. So what is a fiber product? So you have given, you have maps A from A to T and B from B to T. So either you think of maps if you are in the category of topological spaces, or you think just of morphisms in C. So this would be, again, in top continuous maps. Okay. 
And uh, then you define the fiber product by a universal property, an object C together with morphisms. I don't know what I want to call them. I want to call them a prime and b prime, a prime from c to a, b prime from c to b is a fiber product of a and b over t if, and now I have to erase again, So I'm not sure how category theory is treated in Portugal and in Spain, if this is standard material or if you are not so familiar with it. So as I'm not able to explain everything here in class, I thought maybe to do, maybe not next week, but the week afterwards, an extra session where we go in more details with these things if you are not familiar with them. Okay? At the moment, I just dropped the names. But if you don't feel comfortable, please give me a sign, and I will, I will explain this separately. Okay? So what is the property? We have a, the following diagram. C A prime A T B prime B T. Here we have A, here we have B. So first we assume that this commutes. Uh, <clears throat> so this is part of the assumption. Now you take some D, an object. And you assume that you have given A tilde, sorry, and B tilde, now that's an A tilde, A tilde, B tilde. Whenever you have a commutative diagram like this, if this commutes, then there exists a unique morphism phi from D to C. So that's uh, the categorical definition, which is not very clear what it means if you don't fill it with substance. So in topological spaces, and also for algebraic varieties, it's very easy to see what this means. A times B over T is just the set of points AB in A times B. So we assume that we know already what the Cartesian product is. Okay, And what is the requirement? Ah. That's not very good, because I used a and b for my maps. So let me call it x and y. Sorry. x, y in a times b, a of x equals b of y. Okay. Now if you take <clears throat> if you take B just a point T, T in T, then A times this T over T will be just a fiber A T fiber of A of the map A over T. So that's a complicated way to define fibers. 
it's like this. Yeah. I cannot help it. Think of topological spaces. And this definition, which is here, also works for algebraic varieties. So here, this is just a set theoretic definition. You take all pairs x and y, which are mapped under the maps a and b to the same element. Okay. <clears throat> so of course, in the literature, they don't talk about uh, much about category theory. They assume everything known. So we, I want to give you at least a little bit of uh, input about these concepts. OK. I hope you are still alive. I told you that we have to work a bit to define modular spaces abstractly, but that's life. So this was a notion of family. So now let me, let me come to equivalence relations. So I want to do two remarks. And then probably we will have to stop. So if x to t, and you may think again of topological spaces, is a family in C inside D, I recall this means the fibers are in the smaller category, but x and t could be in the large category D. Then we get a map So how do I want to call this? I want to call this pi. We get a map from T into the objects of C. So what is this map? Let me call it O sub pi, because it goes into the objects. It sends, now I write again t, but of course I would have to make precise what I mean by t if I'm just in an abstract category. But think again of topological spaces. T goes to xt, the fiber. Okay. So <clears throat> in abstract categories, points T, I treat this T as an, a point or an element of t has to be defined as a morphism from t0, t0, sorry, t0 was the, the terminal object into now, think again, in topological spaces, t0 will just consist of the topological space of one point. And if you take a map from the one point topological space to an arbitrary topological space, this just means to pick a point inside capital T here. Okay? So this fits together. Okay? So, <clears throat> yeah. So there's a notion of point also here. Now, B, now we come to our equivalence relation. We had this map of objects, but we want to consider objects up to equivalence. Let now this symbol be an equivalence relation. Uh, between 
objects in C and assume given an object M and this object script M will be in the larger category D which is in bijection with the set of equivalence classes. <clears throat> so again, to, be, to make this more precise, I'm sorry that I have to cheat quite a bit. Think of C again compact topological spaces. D, all topological spaces. And <clears throat> as equivalence, we take homeomorphism. Of topological spaces. Now we may want to classify compact topological spaces up to homeomorphism. And assume that we have an, a nice topological space M whose elements correspond precisely to equivalence classes. Okay? Once we have this, then the family we have defined, considered before, then the family is pi from x to t defines a map, which I now call small m pi, which goes from x to script m, sending now t, sorry, this goes from t to m, of course, This goes from t to m. And t just goes the fiber of the family. But now we take the equivalence class. Okay. And of course, this gives rise to a commutative diagram. We get from the object of C, we go down to M. If we take here an object Y, we send it to its equivalence class. So let me call this just a canonical map. Here we have T O pi, and here we have m pi, OK? And pi going from x to t. So t goes here to xt, and then it goes down to the equivalence class, OK? So c, a third remark here. We are approaching the definition of moduli space, but we need these preparations. So please have a little bit of patience. Now assume I really want to motivate why the definition is as it is. Now assume that M is a topological space. Assume that we could equip M with a topology. Huh? So a topology on the space of equivalence classes. Yeah? 
then it's very natural to require that the map from t to m, this map mp, is continuous. Then it is very natural to require that m pi is continuous. And this will be part of the definition of a moduli space. Okay. So <clears throat> there's one step missing before we can go to the definition, which I will do not next time, but the time afterwards. We already defined or we considered equivalence relations on the objects. What is missing, and I will do it next time, still need the notion of equivalent families. Okay. And then after this, we can give the definition of modular spaces. So don't be afraid. This was, of course, more challenging than before. We will come back to it. We will explain it in detail. We will see many examples. But I want to give you also the general framework before we go to the concrete situation of endpoints on the projective line and PGL2. Okay. So that's all for today. I will. Okay. Yes. I would like to ask a question. Yes, please. Uh, condition C is only referring to the category of topological spaces. So what happens if your categories C and D are other, uh, are different categories, not topological spaces? Of course, of course. But uh, so the, when we look at the equivalent families, the notion of equivalence of families, then uh, the, this continuity will be captured differently, yes? And of course, our main examples are not just topological spaces, but even algebraic varieties. And then we require, of course, this map to be continuous. Yeah? In completely abstract categories, I don't really know what would make sense, yes? But uh, I will think about it. Yeah. Thank you for the question, but at offhand, I I think one may just have to drop it. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much for your interest and and patience. Uh, and I will keep you informed about the class next week. I will stay here now, and I will record already the class on cross ratios and. Uh, uh, points protective uh, geometry. So this will be completely opposite to today's class, and we return to this topic of moduli in two weeks. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.